All right, Dan, looks like we're live here, the Saratoga yes, Podcast. Yes, we are. I had a little bit of a delay on my end, but uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Saratoga Springs and beyond to the Saratoga Podcast, episode number 59. Uh, I'm here with my good friend, Adam Israel, a co-host on this. Our third co-host, Robin Dalton, uh, has a personal personal commitment today. She cannot join us. Uh, Adam, uh, how, how, are, how are you doing? You're outside. Yeah, yeah, I'm outside. Uh, we're on a little family vacation, so there's a lot of people staying in a small cabin. So I'm actually at a relative's cabin on, on the front porch here. So if the wind picks up, I apologize. I'll mute the mic. But uh, I think we got a great show today. We have uh, our commissioner of public safety, uh, Jim Montanino, on, who's going to be addressing the, the march down Broadway by the uh, 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 number of Proud Boys, Dan. Did you see that? Um, I, you know, I only saw it online, of course. Uh, I didn't happen to be downtown on Sunday. On Sunday. Uh, kind of shocking and appalling, and uh, uh, you know, kind of out of the blue, right? Um, and uh, that's and then they went down to Balson Spa, apparently to uh, to Waterford as well. Um, I'll mention something about Balson Spa later later in this. Um, and that, of course, Saratoga being Saratoga, that created a a political uh, uh, incident, I guess you could say, or a pro- political action, which uh, we're going to talk to Commissioner Montanino about. And um, he, as Commissioner of Public Safety, is uh, tasked with a lot of things about this because there were, um, yes, yeah, sure, you, you can, you know, First Amendment rights, but there are still when it falls to a parade and so forth. You still need permits, and he'll he'll touch on that. Uh, what uh, and uh, Adam, your your direct uh, knowledge of it? Uh, what you didn't happen to be downtown Sunday, did you? No, I was I was out of town, but I uh, we caught someone on social media. But also about the, the political part and something we'll talk to, to, to Commissioner Montanino about. Um, the mayor, uh, again, demanded a report, which is some may argue is in his purview as a mayor under the charter. Some may say this is outside of it. We'll ask Commissioner Montanino about that. Uh, but he demanded a report and him and Commissioner um, Dylan Moran uh, seemed to imply that I think the police either knew about it or should have known about it. And Commissioner Montanino you know, replied back that the uh, the counts department handles permitting these these operations. So we're here to try to break it all down. And I think Dan, we should bring on the the good commissioner to to give us an update about what exactly happened and what was the city's response. Yes, uh, this let me bring him in here. Commissioner Montanino, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Oh, thanks for having me very much, Dan. Hey, you know, um, Adam and I were talking. There's, there's the incident, and you, you, heard, you heard us talking. You were backstage. There's the incident. Then there's some politics involved, and you know, maybe some administrative functions involved. But they all, uh, a lot going on here, and we want to bring you on to both explain um, the investigation portion of it, and then maybe a few minutes down well, the road. Can we start? Can I jump in? Uh, Professor Montanino, we've known you to be a very detail-oriented guy, uh, in, in a very informed gentleman. So what exactly did happen? Can you give us a breakdown of, of the actual march? Were they blocking traffic? About how many? About what time? And so on. Well, in terms of the specifics, you know, it came out of the blue. There was no advance notice given to the city at all. Uh, in terms of our department learning of it, there was a call from a private citizen to our 9-11 dispatchers saying that there was something going on on Broadway. And one of our sergeants immediately responded to the scene. And the entire incident, I believe, took somewhat less than maybe 10 minutes. Uh, they apparently appeared on Broadway, they got out of a number of cars, there was one yellow pickup truck that was part of their procession. Uh, they, they walked down Broadway for a bit. When the sergeant arrived, he walked up to the person who seemed to be leading the group and had a conversation with that individual, asked them what they were doing. The person said that the group was the Proud Boys and that they were marching to bring back law and order and that they were just finishing their demonstration and they were moving on to another city, but uh, didn't say what city. So they climbed into their vehicles and drove off. The sergeant followed them for a bit to see what direction they were headed, alerted uh, through dispatch the county law enforcement as well as uh, state law enforcement to let them know what had just happened and what the stated intentions of the group had been and the direction of their travels so that 
uh, other authorities could be alerted ahead of time. And that was basically it. Uh, there, were, there were no uh, disturbances other than the presence of the people who walked down the street. Uh, no body reported any uh, injuries, no property damage, and nothing of the sort. Was That's there right. anything verbal going back and forth, perhaps between citizens downtown and, and the group? I, I heard from some of the people that I spoke to that there were some comments passed back and forth between uh, people in the neighborhood who were troubled that this particular group chose to march in Saratoga. Uh, there, there were some words exchanged. I don't believe from what I heard from the individuals I spoke to that there was anything particularly uh, offensive by either side uh, and, and not very much of that in terms of the quantity of it. Right. And um, Adam, did you, uh, oh, you're, you're muted, Adam. I'll, I'll just ask uh, him, kind of restate your question from earlier, or segue now, Commissioner, if you could for us. Um, we, as you know, we, you know, there were a couple articles, your, your report that you uh, submitted uh, quickly Monday night, and you indicated that uh, there may have been a violation of the city code. Uh, could you expand on that and where, it, to the extent that that is an ongoing investigation, where that is uh, intended to head to? Sure, sure. Well, the mayor issued a, uh, was a press release, but independent of the press release, the mayor sent me a request under 3H of the city charter for a report on the incident. And that I received somewhere around 1.30 or so uh, Monday afternoon. He asked that I have the report in by the close of business Thursday, but in light of the importance of the matter, I felt that it was something where uh, Deputy Titu and I would drop what we were doing and get on it so that there would be a written report done as soon as possible. And we stayed after hours a little bit and had the report completed by, I think, about 6.20, 6.30, something like that. Uh, we went and got copies of the police reports that were generated from the incident. I know that Kenneth was reviewing the, uh, there was some surveillance footage on a pole camera. There was dash camera footage from a police vehicle that responded to the scene. Those have already been burned to disk and have been provided to various members of the press pursuant to FOIL requests that uh, went out pretty shortly thereafter. And I, as I say, I prepared the report, uh, responded to the mayor's questions, and basically the only offense that I could see that uh, was clear was the fact that there was uh, what by definition under the city code is a parade uh, had taken place without a permit. And the code's pretty clear as to what a parade is, uh, and this, I'm fairly confident qualified as a parade. Uh, and under the code, there's a requirement of a minimum of 30 days in advance, a request for a permit. And in addition, there needs to be a certificate of insurance provided to the city so that the city knows that if there are any liabilities flowing from the parade, that the city will be indemnified for that. And my understanding is that there never was any permit application filed, no permit provided and other than that there the the code there's another code provision for demonstrations which don't require a permit but require notice to the city uh, demonstration though is defined as having more than 25 participants and i i, I don't know I, I haven't sat and looked at every inch of footage and tried to identify who's who's part of the parade and who's just walking down the street, but I don't know that there were enough people for it to qualify as a demonstration. But the fact that they were actually marching down Broadway and did cross at least one street, I think it fits the definition of parade more clearly than demonstration. And so uh, there, there should have been a permit application. Apparently there wasn't. There should have been a certificate of insurance filed with the city. There wasn't. And, and, and Commissioner, you alluded to this, or you probably said it pretty much in the uh, Gazette article and others, 
Um, this is not an easy task to come up with arrests here. You have people covered with masks, several people. Uh, it's a it's an ordinance. You got to worry about selective enforcement. I mean, it's it's very possible that this, at least from a uh, investigation police department uh, standpoint, as far as uh, uh, prosecuting some somebody for a petty offense, it very well could go nowhere. Would, would that be a correct assessment? Well, it, it that certainly is a possibility because yes, they were wearing face coverings, which. I should mention the code provision that deals with the with parades uh, prohibits face coverings. But the, first of all, the language of the ordinance is a little strange. It talks about face coverings from the chin to the forehead. And that provision is an old provision. And my belief is that it's related to a provision in the penal law that was written many years ago. Uh, with the Ku Klux Klan specifically in mind, uh, that, as you know, their face coverings are complete. Uh, they, they, they wear full hoods. Uh, obviously, we're in a post-COVID world, and it would be sort of difficult to say that our city ordinances prohibit wearing a mask in a public place. Uh, from what I saw, they, they, the facial coverings that the participants had were not full face. It wasn't from uh, from chin to forehead. It was uh, it was kind of a cloth face covering that many people wore during the pandemic. So uh, it, it would be difficult, certainly, to prosecute that particular offense. But I think, Dan, what you're alluding to is, is the difficulty of, of identifying specific individuals. I know we do have one license plate number from a vehicle that was part of the procession. So uh, uh, we're able to identify the owner of that vehicle. So there, it, it might be possible uh, with some further investigation to identify one or more of the participants. Jim, let me ask you, because this, this, this gray zone of free speech versus uh, violating city code or, or law has been something that Saratoga has been uh, the challenge Saratoga has been facing for years now. Uh, I, with, with an incident like this, you're going to have people in the moderate, like myself, and the left say, listen, you know, the, this is a despicable group who tried to overthrow our government. Um, they, they, other municipalities have used the fact that they've used violence to, 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 to advance their positions in the past to stop a group like the Proud Boys from marching. You also have people on the far right say, look at, look at what... Uh, um, you know, the BLM protesters, they block streets and block cars for hours. Uh, not hours, pardon me. That's that's not, but but they you know their their demonstrations or parades were significantly more disruptive than this one. Why what, you know what's where does the line fall for you or as a commissioner, do you leave it up to say uh, the commissioner of accounts to to offer the you know he Commissioner Moran's the one who is in charge of issuing the permits for these kind of events. Do you have a feeling on on where that line is with the, with free speech versus the the the, uh, the 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 need to follow law? Well, you know, it, it's an excellent question, Adam. And you know, you're you're aware, and so is Dan, that uh, I've been an, an attorney for 35 years. And I was a prosecutor, I was a defense attorney, and I worked in the judiciary for 26 years. So uh, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the, the subject matter. I, I don't pretend to be a constitutional expert, uh, but certainly I'm aware of the fact that the First Amendment is, is uh, number one for a reason, that political speech is carefully protected, as well as the right of free association is carefully protected. <laughs> I'm also aware that reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on the exercise of First Amendment rights are constitutionally permissible. So I am certain that there is no infirmity in the city's requiring a permit and prior notice to an event like this. But I think the, the question that does come up, as you alluded to it, Adam, is uh, uh, the question of whether there's selective enforcement that yes, there, there are groups who have uh, demonstrated and uh, marched in our city on a regular basis on uh, a number of recurring events who have not filed permit applications and, and so haven't had permits. So that, that's a separate question, the question of, uh, uh, of what would be the repercussions of uh, prosecuting this group 
or members of this group for violating the city ordinance when others may not have been prosecuted for it. And, and so uh, it, certainly this has caused us to do a lot of thinking here at City Hall, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more conversation in the near future. Uh, but I think that we will need to sit down and come up with a, a coherent and equitable strategy for dealing fairly with anyone who wishes to uh, exercise their First Amendment rights, but are required by the city ordinance to follow certain do you, do you feel that's something the other commissioners and the mayor would be open to, to as the governing body of the city, as a group sitting down and kind of coming up with, like you said, a guideline or rules to follow when 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 approving permits or when enforcing laws uh, for these groups that choose to come to our, our, our downtown area and march and disrupt traffic and operations? Yeah, well, I, I think there, there certainly needs to be the conversation as I indicated in my report to the mayor, you know, we we would go forward with the prosecution. Uh, now I have to asterisk that, right? This is a violation of the city. This would be an, an allegation of a violation of city ordinance. From what I can see, there are no penal law offenses that were committed. So what that means is the prosecuting authority would be the city attorney and not the district attorney. So the city attorney is in the mayor's department under our form of government. And in addition, since this is a quasi-criminal offense that would follow the criminal procedure law in its prosecution, we would need the commissioner of accounts to sign the supporting deposition because he would be the person uh, with direct knowledge of whether an application had or had not been filed for the permit. So as a practical matter for the matter to proceed to prosecution would require the, the cooperation of three of the five members of the city council because of the interplay of public safety, the mayor's department through the city attorney and uh, the accounts department. Can, can I take that with a segue right there? Cause you talk about the cooperation. Hey, Adam, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to cut you off if you need it. No, follow, no, but... I got, I, I'm done Dan. I'm the okay. It's a perfect segue here. Because you mentioned cooperation, city council, and my take on it is, you know, the three of us on this screen right here, as well as Robin, and so many, so many of us watching and so forth. I, I won't speak for the world, but are, are disgusted by what that group stands for—the bigotry, the hatred, so much more. So, if ever there was a time for the city council to stand together, it was, a, you know, Sunday afternoon into the the, the weekdays this week. And yet what I saw, what my take is, is, and, and, and you know, I, I've been critical of you in the past, but it seems like they took this as an opportunity to let's attack Commissioner Mactanino and use this to, to tighten the screws against him and point fingers at him. Is, is that where you're at in your head? Do you not want to talk about that? Or it just seems like it was an unfair attack at the very time that we need uh, uh, the city council to stand together and strong. Uh. It, you, you raise some 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 very good questions, Dan, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to address them at, at a little bit of length. Uh, this is, as as you say, this is a serious matter. This is a group that has been involved, as we know, a number of their members have already been sentenced to significant prison time for what happened on January sixth of twenty twenty one. I remember watching the video of that as it unfolded that day, and it, it looked to me like our federal government was in jeopardy of uh, almost collapse at that. But for, for some hours, it looked like the darkest days uh, for our country. Certainly the darkest days that I've lived through with the possible exception of 9-11 of itself. Uh, so, we, we need to be serious about the response that we make to what happened over the weekend. Uh, and it's important for us to act together. And as I mentioned in my report, and as I've said to you, I'm fully prepared to move forward with this and it will require the cooperation of the city council to do that. Now, have, having said that, I received uh, a copy of the press release that was issued by the mayor's office 
and and was troubled because the the press release itself begins with mayor kim announces actions by city council uh i wasn't on notice of any actions by the city council the press release has quotes from three of the five members of the city council i i wasn't aware that three of the members had discussed this among themselves and I don't know the circumstances of that conversation. No, we're all certainly aware of the open meetings law and what the ramifications of that are. And and I I don't I don't even want to go down that road as to as to how this occurred. Uh, you you make a good point that the the press release certainly has some quotes in it that look like they're intended as as uh, uh, I'll I'll say a, a personal attack as though somehow I was asleep at the switch uh, because of this incident when we now know because there's been a lot of coverage of it there was no prior notice to the city and as soon as the department of public safety was notified of the situation dispatch sent a sergeant there who responded took a report interviewed people alerted other authorities of the fact that the group was an impromptu demonstration that intended to move to other places uh, so we did everything we could under the circumstances and since there were no obvious penal law offenses being committed there were no arrests made and there were there was no uh, attempt at impeding individuals in in what they were doing for the day uh, and as you see i followed through with the mayor's request he he asked for a report by the close of business Thursday. I had it for him a few hours later. So and, and, it's and I, I'm serious. I, I have to ask you, have you spoken to the mayor or Commissioner Moran either through text, telephone, or directly since this occurred Sunday? Uh, no, we haven't had a conversation about this. I've, I've met with the mayor. In fact, we, we were at a meeting on the uh, on the homeless, uh, the temporary homeless shelter on Adelphi Street. We were at that meeting yesterday evening, but this wasn't a topic of our conversation. So, so no conversations or communications at all amongst you or, or anyone else on this? I, you know, from as a citizen standpoint, I say, boy, that's terrible that you're that the, the they're all communicating via press release. And again, I pointed out you were the one that was being attacked here. I, I think um, that as a as a citizen, I I, I demand better uh, something this serious that it's all maneuverings and political, uh, uh, you know, uh, attacks and so forth, that they all need to do better. And in fairness to them, um, perhaps if you, uh, if you could do this over Sunday, I, I get the feeling that they were upset that they weren't notified by you. And I don't know that I'm, maybe I'm reading into it. If that's true, I, I think that's legitimate, right? I, on something important, um, uh, the other, you know, the city council should be talking to each other. Hey, this just occurred. I'm on it. Boom, boom, boom. This is all I know. Um, perhaps there's a, uh, I'm trying to give fairness to everybody I can here. And when they're wrong, they're wrong. I'll point it out in my opinion. I'm, and uh, it's just Dan's opinion. But when you're right, I'll point it out as well. Is, is that is that fair that perhaps you could have given them a, the city council a call at some point Sunday and said, here's what I got? Well, well here, here's, here's the thing, Dan. Uh, I didn't know about the incident until the following day. The incident occurred on a Saturday. And That's I, wasn't, that was Sunday. I wasn't aware of it until I was contacted by the press. And then I called uh, Deputy Titu, uh, who had been in contact with, with some people on Saturday. Uh, so I wasn't even aware of it until 24 hours after the event itself had occurred. Sure. So none of the other commissioners called you and said, hey, hey Jim, what, what the hell happened yesterday? That, that didn't occur? No, that didn't. Sure. And, and, you know, I, I think a, a, a point that I'd like to make is, is one of the reasons I, I did my written report in the time frame that I did was so that there would be communication with the rest of the city council. I sent it to all the council members and all the deputies uh, it, as soon as I possibly could so that the public could have a record of the communications, the communications that I'm writing. And the, the impression that I wanted to leave was that A, I do take this matter very seriously, B, uh, it was over and done with long before I had any notice of its having happened. And indeed, the city itself had no notice of its happening until it was almost over. Uh, it, the whole thing was about a 10-minute uh, event. 
And again, no crimes were committed, and so there would be no reason for anyone to have been arrested or impeded uh, yeah. at, at the time. If, if, if I can end this on uh, a positive note here, uh, Robin Dalton texted Adam and I and said, uh, maybe other people know about this, but uh, this is the first I heard about it from Robin. Right from Robin. Um, there's a rally this Sunday to stand against, I'm quoting uh, her text here, uh, not on our watch, a rally to stand against the Proud Boys marching in our community. We are better than this. This Sunday, August 13th at 2 p.m. at the downtown post office, uh, bring signs celebrating diversity, acceptance, democracy, all the good things. Um, of course, that begs the question: Is is a permit needed? But I'll I'll leave that go for now. Um, but uh, well, she better get more than twenty five people. It sounds like, huh? I, I'm sorry. It sounds like that twenty five people cutoff is a big a big cutoff between a parade and a demonstration. You know, technically speaking. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm you, not you know, a situation. It's a very interesting little kind of sidebar that that. 25 no, it's, it's 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 a very good point, Adam. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize for talking over. I didn't mean to do that. Now, it, it's a very good point, Adam, and, and the, the, the code doesn't, the parade doesn't kick in from what you're saying, because it sounds like this is going to be by the uh, post office. If, if, you're, if you're not marching, if you're not impeding the flow of traffic, then it's not a parade. This would, this would follow the code's definition of a uh, demonstration. Got it. The, code, the code doesn't require a permit. But the code, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, uh, it, it, it requires notice. Uh, it says uh, the filing of a declaration. So uh, the, the, uh, uh, the requirements for something like a certificate of insurance or the 30-day notice requirement in a parade uh, wouldn't be part and parcel of just a demonstration. Uh, so it kind of sounds like if this is being made public, that you know, de facto the city will be on with the fact that demonstration. Yeah, and I, I, I just like to end with, with and this is a little conservative of me coming out, but what, what we see in the national level with the far right, I think. You know, what we see in Saratoga is we see city business being impeded by the, the far left um, in, in our city. We see the streets and cars being blocked for longer than, you know, 10 minutes by the far left in our city. So I would hope if, if, if nothing, you know, I'm not justifying anything that happened with this group because I do think the, the Proud Boys are a despicable group, but that we do kind of a unified code where regardless of your own politics, uh, First Amendment rights are protected within reason and equity will spread among groups uh, regardless of their political affiliation. So I, I wish you the best and luck and hopefully that comes out of all this. Yeah, no, thank you, Adam. And and, and I agree with what you just said 100%. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, we, we need to be even handed and fair uh, in, in the way we handle uh, these kinds of situations. Commissioner, we, uh, on behalf of both of us, thank you for coming on with us today. Uh, please, uh, uh, I, I, you know, if you could find a way, and I will, uh, if, if the other uh, council members are watching as well, we need five people together on this issue um, to to address this, so we stand unified. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the time and the opportunity. Take care. All right. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. All right. Well, that was that was interesting, Dan. Don't you think? Yeah, Adam, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. I did remove him. His, his, his screen froze, but uh, I don't know if he's still with it. Anyway, um, and and I have to say here, because um, I I was I made some commentary on what's what I see going on with the city council. Anyone that's watched this podcast for a while, no, I've been very critical of Commissioner Montanino in the past. I've even mocked him on this podcast. I'm a supporter of his opponent in the election. One of his opponents, Tim Cole. Uh, um, and so the fact that I'm pointing out that he was wrong here, I think that should be significant to people, um, that at least two of the council members, the, the, the mayor and commissioner Moran simply use this as an opportunity to attack one of their political opponents when they should have done the right thing and stood together. Yeah. Well, maybe we could get the, one of them, you know, I know commissioner Moran is, is, has come on the show before mayor Kim has too, but I would love to hear their 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 side of it, what they uh, what they thought could be done differently, and, and their input about what 
because these issues are affecting our city, right? So, uh, Commissioner Moran, uh, hopefully you're watching. If you are, um, come on, or, or, or Mayor Kim, you as well. But uh, Dan, no, Dan, you, you certainly do call it as you see it without putting a, 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 a bias on it. And I think that's why people like watching you. So. Well, well thanks. Yeah, C Commissioner Moran and, and Mayor, if you're watching, uh, you have an open invitation for next week. Um, uh, Adam, I, I'm going to ask to do kind of a, a significant shift here, and this is, you know, what we're talking about is very serious. Um, do a little bit, a bit of shift uh, to some horse racing issues, and when we bring up horse racing issues on this podcast, it's, it's not about uh, who's in the stakes race on Saturday. It's about how horse racing is, you know, in many ways the backbone of the county's economy and perhaps the capital region's economy, how things in horse racing directly affect Saratoga Springs, whether you're a fan of horse racing or not. So when we talk about horse racing, uh, that that is is why we do it. And we have a special guest here today. I'm going to bring him on and introduce him here to talk to us about two different aspects of, of significant occurrences in horse yeah, racing. Two, two big one, events. I'm looking forward to getting his input on it. You know, one, one example. Bill Gottimer uh, is an attorney. He's a horse owner. He's held just about every job in horse uh, in horse racing, including as a groom uh, back back in the day. Uh, he, he's a Saratoga Springs re resident most of the year. And uh, he happens to be a good friend. We did a, pod, a horse racing podcast um, uh, last year for several weeks, actually into earlier this year, uh, about horse racing with a Saratoga focus. Uh, Bill Gottimer is the attorney that represented Katie Davis and her husband when uh, some gaming rules prohibited them from racing unless they were a coupled entry, which was absurd. And uh, Bill's such a good attorney, he was able to get that uh, uh, rule uh, changed. Uh, Bill, uh, thank you for joining us today. And, and how, how, how are you doing? Well, thank you for the kind words. Um, I, I guess we're here to, to talk about the events of, of the last weekend and, and, and this uh, early this week and kind of a dichotomy, you know, one, one quite tragic and, and maybe one hopeful. Um, the, the weekend, the last weekend at Saratoga Race Course was by any estimation among the darkest weekends the race course has ever had. Uh, it, it began with a sudden, sudden weather change on, on Friday that resulted in the balance of the card, the third of the card being canceled summarily. Uh, it was followed some Saturday by a, by a beautiful day and a large, happy crowd uh, to view good racing and, and uh, you know, the, the, the tragic breakdown of, of uh, uh, a Maple Leaf Mel strides from the wire in front of everybody, just pretty much, pretty much horrified the the entire the entire uh, racing community and, and, and viewers on a nation on a nationwide uh, uh, nationwide audience. And then was followed Sunday by uh, another fatality on the race course and and the uh, cancellation of all grass races on the grass for the day, uh, resulting in in a significant change to betters and, 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 uh, and a lot of criticism to New York Racing Association. So it really was a confluence of events that that really cast a game in, in, in uh, a bad light from almost every angle, you know, from, from, a, from a, an animal's right perspective, from a, from a predictability standpoint, from a, from a gambling perspective. It, it's really a set of days that, that, that the industry wishes they could they could erase from their uh, from existence. Um, I I believe that one of the things that's new recently is that horse racing is now subject to both state and federal regulation. And I write about this a little bit in the upcoming article I'll have on on Friday in my column in Saratoga today. Um, but regulators tend to tend to be reluctant to, to act or move slowly, but when they do, they tend to do so bluntly. And and, and I hope that's not the case here uh, because Saratoga, you know, is, is, Saratoga Race Course is, is the centerpiece of, of, of this town for, for much of its history. And it's, it's uh, it, it, was, it was a particularly bad day. Uh, bad set of days. Can I, can I interject real quick? As, as far as the regulation goes, is there any regulation that you think could have prevented these tragedies that you would have liked to see done differently? And is there any regulation that you said, you know, that I, I think all government entities have a, 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 that kind of act that way where, where 
as a business guy, I always said you want to regulate yourself before the government comes in and regulates for you because they're going to overshoot. So is there anything, you, any, any regulation you think that would help that's reasonable? And is there any regulation you're, you're scared of? Well, I mean, I mean, there's two separate things right here. So, so we'll, we'll speak about the, the, the most important part here, the, the animal safety part. Of it. And, and, and that is something where the sport has constantly claimed that they would self-regulate and has constantly been unable to do so. So, so that, you know, that, that horse has left the barn, so to speak, to use a, to use a bad, bad phrase. Um, the federal government does, in fact, now regulate horse racing. That, that has happened. So, um, you know, the federal government now has the ability to regulate, which includes the ability to, to outlaw. And uh, they, they will have to answer to that. And there's a number of protocols that are now put in place regarding vacation of horses, regarding pre-race, pre-race, um, uh, pre-race inspections. And, and most notably, in this instance, uh, post-mortem uh, crop, crop season, uh, after our boss has had a fatal accident like, like we did on Saturday. So, so yes, I mean, the short answer is if, uh, if it, horse racing exists by a, a social license granted to it by, by government fiat, and, and if, if, uh, if the game doesn't police itself, you know, somebody else will, and, and that could include you know, some pretty draconian measures. Um, th that's certainly the answer on the, on the animal rights portion of the animal, uh, the animal safety, safety portion. I mean, anyone who, anyone who thinks that, that things can't be, can't be regulated or outlawed just has to speak to, uh, you know, the circus, which no longer has animals and, and SeaWorld, which no longer has, has, uh, has uh, uh, live entertainment. So, so that that is something the industry has to be extremely careful about, and, and it's not just it's not just um, from the standpoint of, of of people who are generally in, in against animal uh, animal activities. You know, this is now coming from from pretty significant significant people. Uh, now, you know that being that being said, um, you know, horse racing is is a game that has its risks, and and it, it's. Uh, it's it's not as un, as uncommon as as you would think. It's 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 a sport where where uh, athletes and 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 e both equine and human are, are are you know exerting quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of effort and 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 they can be fragile fragile at times. Um, as as far as the second portion, which is what had the gamblers upset last week. Which was regulations regarding canceling races and changing or changing the surface upon which racing is uh, has run. Uh, it, it, it has gotten way too complicated, and it, it's almost beyond um, regulating by the New York State Gaming Commission, which which has particular rules. Uh, I, I think the power needs to be put in the hands of the stewards or the racetracks to make common sense decisions about refunds or about changing conditions when safety requires it. Uh, I, I believe New York Racing Association felt their hands were tied that when they when they changed the whole races from the from the uh, grass course to the dirt course, they would have liked to have issued refunds. I think they they've stated now that they felt they were unable to do so under New York State Gaming Commission regulations, and there wasn't enough time to to, to get a ruling on it. And, and and that's something that can be easily corrected. I mean, there 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 is something for for strict regulations. Uh, but, but there is also something for uh, for common sense ability of, of the racetracks to make their decisions. So for, for the non, can, if I can break it down for the non horse the horse fans out there, and tell me if I'm right in this. So if you have a pick six, meaning you're picking the winner of six races in a row, and you won the first three, and let's say this, the, the the last three are on supposed to be on the turf, and you pick horses that you think run well on the turf, when the when the races are taken off the turf and put on the dirt you're saying they, they should probably just get a refund instead of having to stick with those horses and keep their money in the bet. Is that correct? Yeah, partially correct. This was, the, yes, there, 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 are, there are all protocols and there are all rules when that happens midway in a pick five or a pick six, a, a, a multi-race ranger. Uh, the problem with this happened that it, it happened short, the change in surface was announced very shortly before the beginning of the beginning of the race, the, the series of races. 
So at that point, they would have liked to have declared a refund. And frankly, you use the vernacular, no bet. Can everyone get a refund? Just cancel the bet. They felt hampered by New York State regulations that required them to follow the protocol, even though none of the races had yet been run. So, so I mean, it's, it's, this is in the weeds here. Um, they've apologized profusely about it as recently in the last hour and have said they'll somehow try to make it up to gamblers. But, but, but I feel for them in that instance because it's a, it's a question of safety. You know, you, you can't run on an unsafe course. Weather up here is particularly unpredictable. It always has been. But this year they've run into a particularly bad spate of, spate of, uh, of volatile weather. And, and, you know, safety comes first. You know, with that, um, a, a series of races spread over a four-hour period. It's difficult, if not impossible, to guarantee that the, that the weather will be fully cooperative. So I mean, that's, that's something that I think can and should be handled by the New York State Gaming Commission, giving the racetracks latitude to do what they feel is necessary for their customers. And, and, and Bill, I assume your Friday article in Saratoga Today will cover some of these topics we're uh, talking about here? It, it will, and, and it will highlight that despite the fact that, that the game was viewed in a poor light this weekend, many, many people – in the game, all the vast majority of people in the game have dedicated their lives to the welfare and benefit of, of these athletes, these equine athletes. And, and, and I think that has to be remembered when, when looking at it either internally or, or from afar. Oh, good. Adam, if you could tee up the next issue, because I know on your What's Going On Saratoga Facebook page, you have a brand new picture there of pretty exciting. We are going to take a shift here, still within horse racing, uh, but this is exciting. And, and again, even if you're not a horse fan, Folks, share the excitement a little bit because it benefits Saratoga. Adam, you yeah. want to ask Bill? Well, we'll get into it. There's no real taxes paid. We can talk about that. I don't know if Bill is in tonight, but $4 million for a two-year-old horse that's never run a race before. Am I correct? Well, correct. It followed, followed shortly thereafter by, by another purchase from another horse for $3.2 million. So last night was quite the night to have this facing tipped in sales. Do you know we how that there. stacks up against Preview? I mean, it were records. I know they tally for the night. They tally for individual horses. Was this a record-setting night? Do you know? Well, it, 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 well, it was. It was not a, a record-setting night for the Saratoga. Uh, Facing tipped in Saratoga sale. I think it's the third or fourth most highest, most most high purchase. Um, but it, it it it's dwarfed by some purchases at the Keeneland sales and other years where 13 million comes to mind. It was one for 12 million. Uh, there's a horse called the Green Monkey who was infamous for 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 going for a very high price and not having a particular amount of talent. Um, and and uh, it's it, this horse had you know wonderful lineage, uh, and it was purchased by the people who owned Medina Spirit, uh, who who was involved in the controversy with Bob Baffert over the last few years. Everybody, Derby. Bill, you, you oh sorry to cut you off. You were there. Can you when you're finished at the sun? Can you share the excitement the excitement in the room as this guy four million and the other guy three point two? Well, any, anyone who's, ever, who's, who's been to the sales realizes there's an inside and outside portion of it, and, and it's quite festive. Um, last night when, when this hip number 165, which is a cult by, Cur by Curlin out of champion the holder, which is why it went for so much money, uh, there was great anticipation that that horse would, would be a, a very high price. So people did fill the gallery. You know, unfortunately, people made noise in the gallery, again, treating it more festive than than then probably was safe. It, it did upset the horse somewhat, but the handlers did a wonderful job of, of calming things. Um, but yes, there was a palpable excitement leading up to it, during it, and, and afterwards. You know. I mean, uh, I mean, that's why it's good so, to celebrate you, something. Oh, you, go you ahead. Touched on it, but again, for, for the for the non horse racing fans, what makes a horse again a two year old horse that's never run a race? so valuable is it how fast it's run as a as a juvenile horse is it its lineage it's mom dad what makes a horse that valuable well or i mean that much of a risk i mean there's there's, a, there's an old there's an old adage that says in, in this game you breed the best to the best and hope for the best and and, <laughs> and that's that's what you had here you had a proven sire uh from a from a dam who is is uh was a champion herself and in her first of her first three falls had 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 a, a, at least one, an early stakes winner, uh, and so certainly you know this. And there is it's it's all about pedigree and about confirmation, which is which is you can't see on a on a paper. You see that physically looking at the horse's confirmation and makeup. And um, 
real quick, does the horse have a name, and and can we expect? Do you think it would ever run at Saratoga? When, when, well, when if, if so, when? The, the horse that the horse does not have a name, um, and to probably be named be named shortly. Uh, the horse will be with Bob Baffert in California at least initially. So it's unlikely that they'll run in that the horse will run in New York um, as a two year old. Uh -huh. But again, it, it, this is it's a speculative. Many many high priced high priced yearlings do not work out. But that's kind of what what the what the uh, the fun is about. I mean, it's it's. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very about, rich man's gambling <laughs> way to gamble, I guess. Yes, I mean, it's in some ways, and it's, it's uh, yeah. You know, this is this is the top of the top. You know, Dan. One one instance that you, you, your listeners may be interested in finding out is um, one of the higher horses that went ever was a horse called Tom Thumb, and and he was purchased against the advice by Sigmund Summer against the advice of his trainer, and he purchased it at a high auction price. And the reason he did so was because his trainer left the room to watch the televised announcement that Richard Nixon was resigning. So that's, uh, you know, back then you didn't have instantaneous communication and, and, and a president resigning was big enough that most people left the auditorium. And, and while he was not, while he was not taking the advice of his, his trainer, Frank Martin, Sigmund Summer bid a lot of money on, 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 uh, on Tom Thumb and and, uh, and 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 Tom Swift rather, excuse me, Tom Swift, and uh, was was a pretty well known bust as far as a, a, an expensive purchase. That was that was going to be my follow up question. <laughs> you answered it, Bill. Hey, thank you for joining us here today and giving us some of that uh, in, inside, folks. Again, every Friday, uh, uh, Bill Gottimer, a, a, a attorney. Uh, horse owner, he knows he knows everybody on the backstretch. Trust me, and uh, uh, look for his article this Friday and every Friday during track season. I think you do it in the off season, but maybe not every week. Bill, is that correct? I would do it, yeah, sporadically in the off season, but once a week during the season. Excellent, a Adam. Any anything? Uh, for no, me? just uh, I really appreciate the insight from uh, somebody who knows the industry like you do, Bill. So thanks for coming on and. You know, hopefully you can maybe get you on one more time before the end of the season. But if not, we'll look for your article in the Saratoga Today uh, weekly publication. My what, what is it? Saratoga Today, what do they they publish weekly, don't they, Dan? Yes, Friday. Yes, Friday. Got Thursday it. night, I guess. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, Bill. Hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, great, Adam. Hey, um, I, I think these were the two topics that you and I wanted to discuss today. Uh, we kept it we kept it uh, brief, folks. Uh, Robin should be back with us next week. Um, Adam, do you got? Uh, do you want to do anything with cheers and jeers or comments? Comments? Uh, no, I I appreciate Commissioner Montanino coming on. Uh, we'd love to get Commissioner Moran or the mayor on here to to kind of give us some insight, not to not to necessarily you know get into the weeds with with uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety, but to give their thoughts on what the city should do in this this gray zone between First Amendment and uh, and the the dangers of, of political speech so uh if anybody's listening who, who wants to come on get reach out to us but if not dan i think it was a really informative show i certainly learned a lot uh yeah i i, I and these are serious topics um one one limited to an economic thing but that's important to saratoga people's livelihoods depend on the horse racing industry and then obviously the first topic we discussed quickly adam I, i've got one cheer and i don't even know the woman's name but the owner of sage wine and spirits in Boston Spa, 55 Front Street in Boston Spa. She went out and confronted the uh, the, the protesters uh, when when they moved on to Boston Spa. And they tried attacking her via Google reviews and so forth. And uh, as I understand, she's getting, uh, uh, she posted on your website or somebody posted on her behalf on what's going on Saratoga I Facebook page, Adam. That, but... And and um, people are coming in, and I'm going to get down there today. I, I don't even need a bottle of wine, but I'm going to buy her a bottle of wine for doing the right thing. She stood up, and it had to be a bit intimidating, right? It's 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 one person against how many? I don't know how physical it got, or if it got physical at all. But the fact is, that took guts, that took integrity. Uh, I, I shame on me for not getting her name, but Sage Wine and Spirits, folks. If you want to support somebody that stood up to these bigots. Go there and, uh, and, and 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 buy some things and like her on Facebook uh, and, and so forth. So that, I think that's just a positive uh, ending to a negative story. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, Dan, I guess we will, uh, you know, hopefully we'll 
The summer's a little spotty, but we'll see you next week. Okay, excellent. Next right. week, folks. Take I'm care. Get to the beach, Dan. Enjoy. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye.